Well, please be seated. And thanks again, man. You guys, that was out of the world awesome, man. I'm just totally pumped up today. But you know what, friends? I do, in this moment, want to offer my condolences. Tracy. Uh, too soon, right? You're like, too soon, John. Too soon. Well, let me encourage you. You can still cheer for the Oilers. They're in the playoffs still. And I'll be watching those games with eager anticipation of us winning the cup this year, right? Well, it's great to be up with you here today. And I'm going to do a bit of a backstory of my life growing up as it's going to make some sense of what we're going to be talking about. So we, who, how many here are like 50 and under? And like say 45 to 55. How many here? Put your hand up right now. Okay, yeah, there's enough of you here. All right, so when I was growing up, I had an obsession and I loved Masters of the Universe. Now, I'll explain what Masters of the Universe is in a minute here, uh, because for those of you that haven't ever had Masters of the Universe, you have missed out on life. <laughs> so when I was growing up, I was obsessed with these toys called Masters of the Universe, and there was a whole bunch of them that you could get, and they all did some kind of neat little action hero stuff. I remember one of the first Masters of the Universe I got was something called Ram Man, and uh, he was this like... I think this almost looked like a security guard bodybuilder with his head all kind of smashed in. But if you pushed it down, and this little toy, it would lock into place with a spring. And then Ram Man, you push the little button and he'd shoot out. And then he'd, and he'd ram his enemies. You know, and so we had a lot of different characters that were involved in Masters of the Universe. You had stuff like Skeletor. And you had uh, Beast Man. Yeah, there you can see some of their... I remember I, I got Stinkor. Okay, and uh, he was able to defeat his en enemies with the power of a fart. Um, <laughs> but for a kid for, that was 10 years old, that was all pretty entertaining, right? Uh, and so, but my favorite by far, my favorite was He-Man. And uh, you might not know Master of the Universe, but you might know what He-Man was, or you've heard that before. And, uh, and you can imagine a bit of the appeal of He-Man, right? I was a small, awkward little kid growing up, and here I had this toy that was this barbarian shirtless bodybuilder that could go out and get his enemies like Skeletor and, and uh, Beast Man and all these different things. And he had this super cool sword and he had this cat that, uh, that was with him uh, that was called Battle Cat. But the thing about He-Man that was really interesting was that he wasn't this character of He-Man all the time. In the story, in this, in this universe that they created, He-Man was this awkward little kid. But he was able to call upon this power in order to transform into the mighty He-Man and defeat his enemies, right? Now, we all know that. I'm going to try it with my, bis my biggest monster truck voice I can here. By the power of Grayskull... I have the power! Do you remember? I can't quite do it, but yeah. <laughs> so we, but we, do we all kind of remember this now, He-Man? You know, even if you didn't play with it back then, you're probably aware of it now. Um, and the reason that was interesting about He-Man was when they first unveiled it on the scene, it is over its lifetime made billions of dollars for this company that uh, created this thing. I mean, it was that popular at the time. And certainly as an awkward kid, it was popular for me. And you can imagine why, right? Here you've got an awkward kid like myself growing up, and, and I can relate to this awkward kid that needed this power to defeat his enemies. And just by calling out for this power, he was able to find the power to be able to do that. Why I want to bring that up about this He-Man and this children's fantasy, it does spark our imagination a little bit to consider the very real power that we have available to us for Christians to access right now. The power to live out this exceptional life that God wants for you here and now today. What we're going to be talking about today, and we're going to examine this question that somebody sent in in our series on I've Got Questions. And the question was, how do I know the Holy Spirit is in me? Now, it requires a bit of backstory to understand where that question is coming from, but we're going to eventually answer this. How do I know that the Holy Spirit is in me? The first question, I think, for us, and maybe you're new to faith or maybe you're, maybe you're visiting for the very first time, is what is the Holy Spirit? And I, 
when we think about that question, what is the Holy Spirit, it's actually not the right question. The proper question is, who is the Holy Spirit? There are many misconceptions about this, the Holy Spirit. Some view the Holy Spirit as this mystical force. It's kind of like the power of Skull. I have the power. Or maybe the force in Star Wars. We think the Holy Spirit is actually that thing, or those things try to, to explain what the Holy Spirit is. Others understand the Holy Spirit as this impersonal power that makes that's available to followers of Christ. But what does the Bible say about the Holy Spirit? Simply put, the Bible declares the Holy Spirit as God, is God. The Bible also tells us that the Holy Spirit is a divine person. It's a will. It's a being with emotions and will. The Holy Spirit is part of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So what does the Holy Spirit do in our world and in our lives? We're going to go through a lot of scriptures today in order to fully understand and appreciate what the Bible says about what the Holy Spirit does so that we can answer this question, do I have this in my life? So first of all, the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit being involved in creation, the creation of our world. It says at the very beginning of the Bible, in Genesis, let us make man in our image. And it indicates in the Bible that there's this council that includes all members of the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It goes on to say in the Bible, in the beginning when the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, moved upon the face of the waters and brought order out of chaos. The following scriptures as well talks about this work of the Holy Spirit in creation. His spirit made the heavens beautiful. You created all of them by your spirit and you give new life to the earth. So the creation of our world was a result of the decision of the Father, the voice of Jesus Christ, and the active creative energy of the Holy Spirit. That's the first way the Holy Spirit is involved in our world today. Another way that the Holy Spirit is involved in our world is through revelation, being, something being revealed to us talks in the Bible about the Holy Spirit being the author of the scriptures, the Bible. It says this in the Bible, all scripture is given by inspiration of God through the agency of the Holy Spirit. It also says, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but by holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That was in 2 Peter saying that people, when they were writing the Bible, they were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write the words that we know today as the Bible. Excuse me. Revelation, it, talks, it says this about the Holy Spirit. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says, says to the churches. We talked about this last week, friends. Remember we talked about, does God still speak to us today? We came to the conclusion that yes, he does, and he's by his Holy Spirit that he speaks to us. And remember what he said as a promise in Revelations. He who has hears, let him hear what the Spirit is saying, because you will become victorious. You will be victorious. So the Holy Spirit is revealing to us God speaking to us today. God speaking to us today. We're also told in the Bible that the Spirit of Christ was in the prophets and through them testified, this is from 1 Peter, testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. In Ephesians 6, 7, it says about the Word of God, it's the sword of the Spirit. It's a sharp two-edged sword. So we understand that the Holy Spirit then is involved in inspiring Scripture, and we understand that the Holy Spirit is at work in answering that question from last week, if God speaks today. It's through His Holy Spirit that He speaks actively to us, speaking to the Spirit that is within inside of us, illuminating and applying the Bible for us today. That is the Holy Spirit that is flowing in that it's revelation for us. The third way that the Holy Spirit is involved in our world today and in our lives, whoo, I'm going to fall over. Uh, it's these sneakers. They're very grippy. <laughs> they look like I could do sports or basketball, but I'm terrible at those, so those things. But um, So it, the Holy Spirit is involved in revelation. The Holy Spirit is also involved in revealing who Jesus is. 
and who Jesus is to our spirits. Jesus tells us himself in the Gospels that the Holy Spirit speaks not of himself, but of Jesus. And his work is consistently in elevating this redemptive work of Jesus. He keeps himself in the background and puts the floodlights on Jesus. Jesus himself says that about the Holy Spirit. He's, he's actively letting us know that Jesus, his redemptive work, he's dying on a cross for us. He's showing that, illuminating that to us and to our world that this is what Jesus had done in our lives. The Spirit reveals to ourselves, in fact, that, that, that our souls, that Jesus is in fact God. That Jesus did have to die on a cross for mankind. And that he was the only one that could do it. It's through that Holy Spirit that our minds become renewed. That we have this epiphany, this illuminating moment that Jesus himself is God. That's the Holy Spirit working in our lives. The Holy Spirit also convicts us of sin. Since the Holy Spirit is working to make us like Jesus, actively working at that, so he convicts us of sin. Sin is something that will always offend God and hold us back. If we have sin, which we do, he will bring those sins to our attention. And sometimes the Holy Spirit does that when he activates our conscience. Perhaps the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now in this moment through the words of Scripture that show us that we are acting in a way that is contrary to the way God wants us to act. Someone said this, conviction is your best friend. And if we stop feeling conviction in our lives, then we have bigger problems. Because John 16, 8 says this, when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. See, conviction comes at times before sin even happens. The Holy Spirit begins to tap, tap on our heart once temptation starts coming into our lives. And it's our responsibility to respond to that conviction. That's the Holy Spirit himself speaking into our lives. See, temptation itself is not sin, but, and because we can see in the Bible, Jesus himself was tempted to sin. He did not do it. But giving in to temptation is what brings sin into our lives. And the Holy Spirit nudges our hearts at times to, be, to make sure that before we make a move into sin, convicting us of this temptation that's coming. So we need to listen to him as he's speaking into that area of our lives. The Holy Spirit also sanctifies and enables believers to bear good fruit in their lives. See, the work of the Holy Spirit is this ongoing work of sanctification that God wants for all of us in our lives. So I know it sounds like a big word. What, it's, what it is is that God himself is transforming us into being a reflection of Jesus Christ in our world. He wants us to, de be, to take on those attributes of Jesus, that, that we would do that for our lives, but also show others with the power of Jesus in our lives. And that's what God and the Holy Spirit is working at in our lives always, this process of being transformed into the image of Christ. Sanctification. Says so this in Galatians when we have the power of the Holy Spirit active in our lives. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. Against such things there is no law. Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. That good fruit that is wanting us, wanting to take place in our lives is empowered by the Holy Spirit to take place. For the Spirit is helping us to love when we find we have hate in our hearts. The Holy Spirit is actively encouraging us to love more. When we find we do have not joy in our hearts, the Holy Spirit is actively bringing about this fruit in our lives, fruit like a tree. This tree that shows who Jesus is and says in the Bible, when we don't have that fruit in our lives, what good is that tree any longer? See, we want to enable the Holy Spirit to bring about those things. When you don't have peace in your life, when there's just chaos, the Holy Spirit is there to bring that about in your life. When you don't have patience or kindness in your life, the Holy Spirit is there to bring that fruit into your life as we surrender to the Holy Spirit and what he wants to do in our hearts. The Holy Spirit 
gives us power to witness. The Holy Spirit empowers Christians to be effective witnesses for Jesus Christ, and he gives us a boldness to testify of the Lord Jesus in situations where we would normally be fearful or timid. 2 Timothy 1.7 encourages, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. I remember growing up, and uh, I, I first accepted Jesus when I was 17. I've told you this story before, friends. I, I grew up in... Um, a um, agnostic environment in my my home. Uh, my parents didn't believe, and uh, and my parents divorced when I was quite young. And I was sort of flipped around back and forth um, between my parents. That divorce that took place actually really critically affected me as a human being. Like I, I was broken and shattered as a young man uh, when my parents got divorced, and it kind of carried through with me in my life. You know, you, you feel like maybe you're to blame. Uh, you feel like uh, you know that that um, nobody really understands the situation you're in. And, and p- part of the reason for that was that, you know, bearing my parents were s- separated and we lived in different provinces, uh, we were thrown back and forth quite a bit between the two. I uh, grew up in a way that was just very um, absent. I'd say my parents were very absent in, in many ways. Um, you know, and I got into trouble with, with uh, starting to go down a path that was going to be destructive for me. When I accepted Jesus Christ, though, it transformed me so radically that I sense this power of God and his love in my life, these these fruits that started taking place in my life, love, joy, peace. Uh, I found my identity, which was completely shattered when my parents divorced. I found my identity in Christ again. By the Holy Spirit, these things came back to me. And as a result of this power that I sensed in my life, I was sharing with my friends, friends that I, I was afraid that they wouldn't be my friends anymore. You know, I was sharing how how much goodness that Christ had done in my life, and that fear was overcome by the Holy Spirit in my life, giving me the power to share about him. That was the Holy Spirit giving me power to witness. God has not given a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. Power can be many things backed up by the Holy Spirit in that verse. Love that is overcomes the hate that maybe is in your heart that we hold on to with unforgiveness. When we all of a sudden have this supernatural love that takes place in our lives that would point to the fact that this is something beyond what I can muster up in myself. That is the Holy Spirit itself working in you, giving you the power to, to witness and have that fruit in your life. The Holy Spirit also brings for us joy. And it says this in Romans, and Paul instructs us in this, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's in Romans 14. How the New Testament typically describes the joy we receive from the Spirit is like this, hope in, the, in God's grace received by faith fills us with great joy in the Spirit. Joy. You know, I, I've actively lived this out in my life by the Holy Spirit's power in my life. I came to the understanding that there's no way that I could generate for myself what happens after death. I, I couldn't muster up enough goodness in my life to say, hey, I'm going to be going to heaven. I, I, I couldn't do that. Where this joy came into my life was the Holy Spirit was speaking to me to show me that Jesus himself was crucified on a cross in such a dramatic way for my sins to be taken upon him so that I might enjoy the benefit, the gift of eternal life. And that created this supernatural joy that took place in my heart and my life because I realized I couldn't do it and get there on my own. That's that great joy the Holy Spirit comes when we understand God's grace that we cannot work our way towards heaven, but it's by his grace that we are saved. That joy that comes into our lives. Joy in the Holy Spirit. And it's a crucial dimension of the, holy, of the kingdom of God. And it's something we are meant to pursue in our lives. Joy is the heart of reality. And if the spirit dwells in us, we have to have that ultimate joy dwelling within us. So in, to experience the joy of the Holy Spirit is to experience the joy of being alive and life. 
So now we're going to answer that question that was asked. How do I know then if the Holy Spirit is in me? And here's what it says in the Bible. To be a Christian is to have the Spirit of Christ. Romans 8, 9 says this. You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Here's another one from Ephesians chapter 1. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance into the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. When you accept Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is sealed in you. In order to understand the Holy Spirit resting in our hearts, we need to understand what our natural position is before we accepted Christ into our lives. Ephesians 2.1 says this, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. And then 1 Corinthians says, The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Our natural state as sinful beings is inhospitable to the Holy Spirit. And it's only by the Holy Spirit that the gospel truth is illuminated to us. And so when we accept Christ as Lord through faith, the Holy Spirit is then deposited into our lives. So how do you know if you have the Holy Spirit? If you have been born again as a Christian, Having the Holy Spirit marks one off as a Christian. You can't be a Christian if you don't have the Holy Spirit. There are no Christians who don't have the Holy Spirit in their lives. And it's not that unbelievers can't have the Holy Spirit. He is known as our comforter, and he's wanting to be in our lives in unison with any soul that is willing to accept Christ as Lord. What he can do, though, for us, and what he can be in, our, in a believer's lives, it can be dormant, not activated. You know, it's similar in some ways to He-Man, right? He-Man, in his natural state, is this wimpy little kid. And he calls out, and he says, and it's only until he calls out, and he surrenders himself to this power, that he's able to actively participate in the power that comes upon him. It's similar to us, friends. We only can activate the Holy Spirit in our lives if we are willing to call out to it and ask the Holy Spirit to be active, to be living in that spirit of power that he wants so desperately to enact in our lives. It's only when we, we call out to him that we can activate that power. So how do I do this? How do I activate this power? The Apostle Paul was using this in his example when he wrote Ephesians 5.18. He said this, as believers in Christ, we're to be filled with the Spirit or under the influence of God's Spirit. See, being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, it's not a single event that takes place. When you accept Jesus Christ, this deposit that goes into your heart, into your spirit that takes place, it's not meant to just stop there and stay there. It's meant to be lived out through our lives consistently. It's meant to be surrendered to consistently in our lives. It's a continual process, and by that process, it begins to bring fruit into our lives and spiritual maturity into our lives as we are serving the body of Christ and ultimately glorifying God in our lives. See, as believers, we are filled as we seek his guidance in all areas of our life. When we yield to the instruction of the word of God, we yield to the continual filling of the Holy Spirit. And that type of filling relinquishes control to experience being filled with the Spirit means to, to allow Him to have unrestricted access to every aspect of our existence where He can lead and govern us. Being filled with the Spirit is living in the conscience, conscious presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, letting His mind and His word dominate everything that is thought and done. So friends, what do I do? How is it that I am able to live out the Spirit in my lives every day, friends? 
I pray continually, and I said, and yield daily. Just say, Holy Spirit, continue to develop in me what you want for my life. Let the fruit of the Spirit that you talk about that I need to have in my life, let that be fulfilled in me. That joy that you talk about in the Bible that's access through, access through the Holy Spirit, I pray, I say, Holy Spirit, bring me joy. Joy that is unexplainable, inexplicable in our world today. But let me have that joy that you so promise. And as I say that, that prayer, I'm relinquishing control to the Spirit in my life. That's how we are able to live in the presence of the Holy Spirit through our lives. So what's going to happen if I do this? I remember when I was first saved and um, I, I was at a retreat conference and they talked about being infilled with the Holy Spirit, releasing yourself to the Holy Spirit. And I was afraid. I'm like, great, if I do that, I'm going to turn into a wacko, right? And people are going to think I'm a weirdo when I, if I do something like that. I, I, I need to be in control so I don't do weird stuff. Holy Spirit doesn't ask us to do weird stuff. What do we just talk about with the Spirit is what he does in our lives, it seems all pretty like normal, things that we would want for our lives, joy in our lives. We want to, to have that fruit of the Spirit in my life. I want more love. I want more patience. I want more kindness in my life. All those things, I think, are, are great attributes that, that, that the Holy Spirit wants for us. So what can he do? What, what happens when I, I ask the Holy Spirit to, to live out in power in my life? First of all, it's transformation, friends. We undergo this complete transformation at the spirit level, causes our behavior to change. The world believes, you know, in improving ourselves always. Yeah, how many self-help books are there out there? Right? Become a better person, become a better you. You know, but the Holy Spirit Himself, He turns you into a complete new being. It's not about being better, it's about the Holy Spirit transforming you. And when you are transformed by the Holy Spirit, people begin to notice a change. And that's when someone gets saved. Others can see that difference that takes place when you are letting yourself go into the Holy Spirit. And they might not know what it is that has taken place, friends, but a person with the Holy Spirit in them will become a new person. Transformation takes place when we release ourselves into the Holy Spirit. Growing in the fruit of the Spirit happens when we release ourselves to the Holy Spirit. It's that presence of this fruit of the Spirit. I said it before, I want to say it again to remind us. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. When you have that Spirit of Christ within you, those very attributes begin to rise up as you are released. Who doesn't want to have in their lives people that are full of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness? Imagine the opposite of that. That's what you want your life to be characterized by? I want to suggest to us when we release ourselves into the Holy Spirit, those things become the thing that we very desperately want to have in our lives. The third thing the Holy Spirit begins to do in our lives as we release more and more to Him is the leading of the Holy Spirit in our lives. When we have the Holy Spirit in our lives, when we release to him, we can go about our daily lives knowing that the Holy Spirit is directing our paths. You remember we talked last week about God still speaking to us today, and I wanted to suggest this is dovetailed together with that, that the Spirit is speaking to you today. At times he gives us when he's whispering that still small voice into our hearts about direction we need to take as it aligns itself with what the Bible says about him and about direction in life. When we put those two things together, it's the Spirit himself that is speaking to you, that is encouraging you and the path forward in your faith. And that's the leading of the Holy Spirit in your life. Practically, how did that happen for me when I released myself to the leading of the Holy Spirit? I graduated from high school. I didn't know what I was going to do with life. I knew this, though, that I, God had made such a, tr a radical transformation of my life. He gave me something that I could not create for myself. Those very things, joy, purpose, a solid understanding of who I was in Christ, my identity in Christ. He gave me all of those things. But I still prayed, and I said, God, what do you want me to do with my life? 
I don't know what I'm going to do. I graduated high school, and, and I didn't know if I was going to go to school, if I was going to be in the trades, I, nothing. I remember clearly sensing in my life that he wanted me to go into some sort of vocation, uh, ministry, and faith. So I went to Bible school, and, and uh, I still saying that, God, what do you want me to do in my life? What do you want me to do? Graduated from Bible school, I, I pastored for a little while, and I uh, was working with teens, and, uh, you know, that whole time, God, what do you want me to do with my life? And, you know, I, as I was surrendering to that very thing of God's leading in my life, I found these moments that God showed up to, sh- to say that I was on the right path. It was the Holy Spirit himself that was speaking to me, that was guiding me into my future of what he wanted for me as it aligned with his plan for my life. Friends, the Holy Spirit is there to do that for your life as well as it was for me in my life. God's Holy Spirit wants to lead you. The fourth thing that the Holy Spirit can do at times in our lives is show signs of him moving in our lives. One of those signs he does is heal people. And he still heals people today. I have people in my life that I know, and they've told me that God healed them. It's by his Holy Spirit that he heals people. It's by his Holy Spirit that he gives people the gift of healing for others Maybe there's a gift that's in your life that you haven't activated yet because you haven't surrendered to the Holy Spirit. Maybe there's a gift of healing in your life. He wants to use you to pray for people so that they might get physically healed. The Holy Spirit is the one that does that in our lives. It talks in the Bible about speaking in tongues. I remember when I was growing up and I always thought, oh, that's so weird, you know, like it's just weirdness, you know. Um, but I came to realize that by the Holy Spirit is, is as we are releasing into that, that he gives this gift that he talks about. In, in the book of Acts, it talks about this speaking in tongues that takes place as this supernatural occurrence. And that same supernatural occurrence can happen in your life as well. Just being open to it. I have found at times when I have spoken tongues that I've sensed the Spirit of God using that heavenly language to say prayers that I didn't even know what I was talking about. Perhaps I was praying for you in that moment by the Holy Spirit. And he wants to use the same thing in your life as we are going through life, using the Holy Spirit as we release to him to speak in a heavenly language that is activating his power in our world, in your life. That's what the Holy Spirit does. I'm going to ask the team to come back. We're going to get ready for communion today, but I want you to think about this as we are concluding today. Why should I want to nurture the Holy Spirit in my life? Why should I want to even do what I just talked about? Why do I want to release myself to the Holy Spirit? Remember, friends, what I said. When you are a Christian, you've got that deposit of the Holy Spirit in your life. The question was, how do I know if the Holy Spirit is in my life? If you're a Christian, you've got the Holy Spirit. But remember, I said, you can actively keep that at bay. You don't have to live or, or step into the power that the Holy Spirit wants to release in your life. You don't have to do that, but it's only when you relinquish control and ask the Holy Spirit to guide is when that begins to well up within you. So why do I want to nurture this? Because you are going to have the greatest adventure of your life when you actively live in the power of the Holy Spirit, God's will in your life. And we nurture the Holy Spirit within us. We release to the Holy Spirit. We pray, Holy Spirit, guide us to give us that power that we so desperately need. We nurture and we move into the Holy Spirit, release it to give us that peace that is promised by the Holy Spirit. So I can't promise you that when you call on the power of the Holy Spirit, you're going to turn into a shirtless barbarian like he man. But I can promise you this, and I can say this, is that you will have an access to the Holy Spirit that you want. Why do I say you want this, this power of the Holy Spirit? Because it's already in you, and it's actually whispering to you right now, saying, release to me. Let me be in control of your life. Let me guide you. Let me be that, let me, let, listen to that voice that is speaking to you right now through conviction. Maybe that voice is speaking to you right now saying, I, maybe that voice is saying, I want you to speak in tongues today. Maybe that voice is saying, I've got this power 
that I want to release into your life. Maybe it's a gift of prophecy where God gives you the words to say. Maybe it's a gift of power to share with others about the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what Holy Spirit wants for you today. Friends, when, why, why do we want to nurture this, nurture this power? It's because you will go on an adventure like you have never experienced before. And you will experience joy like you will have never experienced before. So do not quench or ignore the power of the Holy Spirit that is available for you today. The power that is already within you that wants to be released in your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I come before you with an open heart and a humble spirit, recognizing my need for the Holy Spirit in my life. I desire to be filled with your presence, to experience your guidance, and to be empowered by your love. I surrender all aspects of my life to you, Lord. Please cleanse me of any sin, doubt, or hindrance that may be blocking the flow of your Holy Spirit in me. I repent of my shortcomings and ask of your forgiveness. Holy Spirit, I invite you to come and fill me completely. Take control of my thoughts, my words, my actions, my desires. Lead me in your ways and help me to walk in obedience to your will. I long to experience the fullness of your presence, to receive your gifts, and to bear the fruits of the Spirit in my life. Use me for your glory and the advancement of your kingdom. I trust in your promises, and I believe that as I seek you, you will fill me with your spirit according to your perfect plan. Thank you, Lord, for your indwelling presence. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So as we move into a time of communion, I want to remind us once again, being filled with the Holy Spirit, it's not a one-time event, but an ongoing journey of faith and surrender. Keep seeking God. Keep inviting the Holy Spirit to be active in your life. And as you continue to grow in that area and your relationship with him, he will give you joy and he will give you power. Go with God. We're going to sing the song, Nothing But the Blood, as we prepare our hearts for communion. We are only here in this place today because of what Christ did on the cross, right? And in dying on the cross, he, replaced, he restored a relationship with God that was broken by sin. And in dying on the cross, he took that sin upon himself so that we didn't have to face the consequences of sin that is in our world. And in rising again, he showed us that he is God, that his words are true, and that he's preparing a place for us in heaven, a place that we all want to be. So let us sing this song as a reminder of what he did in preparing our hearts to, to take communion today and we remember what Jesus did. Team, please.